Welcome to Encounter Grace, where we come face to face with God's work in the world for our good. Join host Jason McKnight as we explore practical issues of community, theology, and leadership in everyday life. Hey, we're glad you've joined us. I'm Jason McKnight. In the studio with me is Ben Hendricks. Ben, good to have you. Always glad to be here. We are going to do one of our favorite segments. We've done this several times now. Three Christians You Should Know, and we're going to do it. Da-da-da-da-da, drum roll, please. <laughs> U.S. History Edition. U.S. History Edition. Three Christians You Should Know. One you know, one you've heard of, one you should have heard of, uh, if we want to just say it like that. Yeah, absolutely. But people who have formed or reformed our country. So this is going to be fun. I'm pretty excited about this. We've had a lot of fun curating over the last <laughs> month or two as we've been thinking, who should we narrow it down to? Because we really could do a hundred different people. But yeah. we got one from the colonial times, one from revolutionary times, and one from the 20th century. Christians who have formed or reformed our country motivated by their faith. Did we mean to spread them out that well? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm you, glad you, you did. missed that I, meeting. Yeah. <laughs> that was when you were at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not doing it chronologically. We're actually going to do it by the one you know, one you've heard of, and then the stranger at the end, if yeah, anyone's yeah. still listening. The really fun one. Yeah. So Ben, tell uh, us about the Christian in U.S. history that you should know. Yeah. One the, of them, anyway. A guy who I would need, really needs no introduction, but it's... Uh, one who's really shaped America, but that's mm. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. And so MLK Jr. was uh, was born in January 15th, 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. No surprise really there. He was the second of three children to his mother, Alberta King, and then his father, Martin Luther King Sr. So I think one of the key things that we need to see early on is that Martin Luther King Jr. was raised in a Christian home. His father was a Baptist pastor and missionary and was an early mm. figure in the civil rights movement itself. His mother, Alberta, would, uh, MLK Jr. famously would say, uh, would sit down with him and his other siblings, reading the Bible to them and discussing what it meant mm. and what would later impact him, how it should influence them. That's great. And so one of the uh, key ways that I think we need to frame MLK Jr. is uh, kind of with a story. So when he... When he was six years old, one of his best friends was a, a white boy across the street. And when they started going to the elementary school, they had to go to different schools. Hmm. Martin yep. Luther King Jr. to the to a black school, this uh, his neighbor to a white school. And as they were moved to different uh, elementary schools, the parents kind of started separating them. And then uh, Martin Luther King Jr. eventually when I was like, hey, wh why, why, why can't I see my friend yeah. anymore? Yeah. Where they responded, and I quote, we are white and you are colored. Hmm. And so hmm. Martin Luther hmm. King Jr. would eventually go on to say that in that moment he was, and I think rightly so, angry, frustrated, and confused, and yeah, stated no that at, from that moment he was determined to hate every white person he knew. Hmm. Wow. But here's wow. the really interesting thing, I think, that very pretty quickly after his through his parents insight and their instruction that it was this and hear this that it was his christian duty to love everyone that all of that began to convict martin luther king jr of of the anger that he had mm -hmm. so we, he would later see and experience numerous uh, discriminating encounters between his father and others that grew uh, a deep frustration for the things he had which gave him really two major perspectives experiences or I think convictions that kind of led through his life. The first, a deep frustration and anger mm. about the racist system he was living in. Yep. It was, yep. and he was Absolutely. angry about it. Yep. But the one that I think really shaped his life and the reason why his ministry was so successful is the second one, a deep biblical conviction to love people. Hmm. So one that he saw and he learned through the experiences he had, but the, the second, the one that his parents taught him Mm -hmm. that it's important to love people. So MLK Jr. would eventually move on and he would get go, go to college and then uh, to Morehouse College where he got a BA yeah. and then attend Crows Theological Seminary where he got a master's and then on to Boston University where he got his PhD. So that's kind of him a little bit in a nutshell, uh, missing a whole lot. Right, right. But what's, so what's he known for? Mm -hmm. And this is where we get into the stuff that we already know him a good, uh, a good bit about. So we know him mostly for two things, his life, and then the unfortunate 
part of his death. Mm -hmm. And so his life was just a life of activism. We see that in Montgomery, uh, his, this kind of the start of his active activism lifestyle was in 1955, the Montgomery bus boycott where Claudette Colvin was uh, arrested for sitting, not wanting to move later that we the one that we most famously know is Rosa Parks. Uh, the boycott lasts 385 days. It wow. eventually led to, and this is the terrifying part for Martin Luther King Jr. It led to him being scrutinized, mm. a, attacked, and his house even being bombed. Mm -hmm. But the boycott eventually ends a year after with a ruling from the U.S. District Court that, that prohibited racial segregation on all Montgomery public buses. So here's the two things that really matter from that. The ruling gave hope. It gave mm, this yeah, idea that like, yeah. things can change, and there, there really mm. is hope here. Mm. And it gave a face to the, to the movement. King's role in the bus boycott transformed him into a public figure mm. where he became the spokesman, spokesman of the civil rights movement itself. So that kind of started everything. And then there's all of these other things, like the Albany movement of 1961, the one that, another famous one we really know, the Birmingham campaign of 1963, a nonviolent protest against segregation in Birmingham where they occupy public spaces they, with marches yep. and sit-ins, they oppose unjust laws, and where we know where uh, MLK Jr. would eventually, he would get arrested and jailed, and where he wrote the letter from Birmingham jail. Mm -hmm. One that, I, we cannot miss this, where he says this, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. A great quote. But one of the beauties- Great truth. Yeah. yeah. And one of the beauties of that letter is it is, dripping with biblical and theological overtones and truths, just that mm. of unity, yeah, justice, compassion, yeah. mercy, he even quotes Thomas Aquinas in it. Mm -hmm. Like he's so influenced by the faith that he's that one that he was brought up in, raised in, but also has owned through his life. Mm -hmm. And then probably I think one of the most famous things, which is in 1963, the March on Washington, where over and I find this this is so encouraging that over two hundred and fifty thousand people organized a march to highlight the des the quote the desperate conditions of of blacks in the southern US mm -hmm. which was at the time the largest gathering of protesters in DC's history and so we all know this but this is where he gave the i have a dream speech which ended up just being one of those pivotal moments which changed mm -hmm. and influenced a nation and so despite some who and i think this is pretty well known like some people who felt that MLK Jr. compromised on his convictions. Like Malcolm X would often speak about that here. The March on Washington was a dynamic success and continued to highlight social yeah. and social reform and the desperate need to just invoke change, that something needed to change. Mm -hmm. And it was clear what that was. I remember in high school standing on the Lincoln Memorial steps mm -hmm. in that same place, looking out in that same direction, and just trying to envision 250, because I'd seen so many it's, pictures it's amazing. and heard the speech. And I just, I kind of wanted to live it, even though it was 1989, you yeah. know, like 25 years and later. And it's mind-blowing to me that, like, <clears throat> at one point, Kennedy looked to, like, have it not end up having because he was yeah. afraid that, and he thought nope. he was going to hurt it because he didn't think, he was like, no one's going to come to this. Yeah. But 250,000 people came through some mm -hmm. of his work as well. But then other things like the St. Augustine, Florida, like in Maine in 1964, New York City in 1964, mm -hmm. Bloody Sunday in the Selma voting rights mm -hmm. in 65, mm -hmm. Chicago open housing movement in 66, the Poor People's Campaign in 68. Like Martin Luther King Jr. spent his life fighting racial injustice. And what I find so interesting and hope-filled is he did it nonviolently. Mm -hmm. That was so influenced by, one, a hatred for, the, for a broken racist system, but one that wasn't willing to compromise on the convictions he had for the Lord. He did that through sit-ins, through marches, through legal battles, through speeches and civil discourses. Hmm. He had convictions and he lived them out. But then, as we know, the tragedy strikes in Mar on March 29th, 1968, when he's in Memphis, Tennessee, in the for or there for support of the Black Sanitary Public Works employees, mm -hmm. and he's murdered. Yep. That's kind of his life, and that's what we know him for, a public figure who lived and then eventually ends up giving his life for the things that he, he was about, yeah. for making a difference in there. So why does he matter for us? Right. Like, I mean, we could spend the next hour and a half and, right. not, and only scratch right. the surface of these. Yeah. So I yeah, wanna, Good luck yeah, summarizing yeah, it. Yeah, right. On, easy, to, easy to talk mm -hmm. about, hard to summarize or focus on, but I'll give everybody two, mm -hmm. a big picture and then a small one. The big picture is, to put it mildly, Yeah. He impacted social and racial reform and progress. Like he became the face and often the engine of social progress. Like 
So much of where we are today is because of the influence and the sacrifice that he's made, yeah, that of good. the speeches that he's given, the work that he's done, and the heart and just care that of, of the words that he said and written all of it at work. And then here's the second one, kind of personal, smaller. He embo- I think he embodies well for us what it means to love our neighbor and stand up against sin, hatred, and wrongdoing. Hmm. Like, I think we always need to ha- just have that. Like, how do we walk that out well? And I actually think Martin Luther King Jr. walked that out really well. He had his issues. Like, he made mistakes. Sure, yeah. We all do. But he was a man who was led by conviction against an anger against racism, but a love for others. And he walks that out well, wanting to love his neighbor well and willing to do that in just different avenues and different places. Martin Luther King made a difference. And he's, le- a le- he's left a legacy that has impacted our nation in incredible ways. Mm. Change of conscience yep. and the laws follow. Amen. I mean, I mean, that's really an Old Testament prophet in our midst, mm. in, in the best sense of the word. Um, that's great. Well, thank you for that reminder, really, yeah. honestly, because January we think of Martin Luther King Jr. And, and you know, and yeah. but it's just so good even here around the 4th of July to be reminded of how God used him. Okay, that's a Christian you know. Yep. Now there's a Christian, let's talk about one uh, you've hopefully heard of, <laughs> and it may not be true, but uh, hopefully a guy way back from the colonial times named Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, uh, a pastor, a theologian, an author, a missionary to Indians, an Ivy League president, the grandfather of Aaron Burr, who is enjoying quite a uh, renaissance in the Hamilton Broadway, Aaron Burr, sir. Uh, Anyway, he is the guy that wrote and preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And Maybe people, because of that title, or maybe they had to read it in high school, and nobody likes what they read in high school, uh, which is not fair to all the high school <laughs> teachers out there. But, <laughs> but maybe that title, you know, gives them the reputation for being a dour man or um, somehow mean spirited, and all these old types, these old Puritans, yeah, like a pure fire and brimstone preacher. I mean, even that's as right. Hamilton was saying, yeah, right, right. Yeah. But actually, yeah, he was serious, but he actually spoke more of God's beauty and his truth than of God's wrath. And um, several historians have noted, actually, that Edwards is one of the authors in uh, the last 500 years who has written the most about God's beauty, which is fascinating because all we think of sinners in the hands of an angry God. And see, yo, that's why he grabbed like my attention so quickly when I was even when I was seminary and reading about him. It was like, I see sinner, like sinners in the hands of an angry God, and I read about this guy who's talking about the shadows we see of the of heaven, yep. Yep. like pouring its way in, and just these beauties. I was like, man, like this is a guy I can get behind. That's right, yeah. and he and he had that experience in the woods early on, like as a maybe teenager, early twenties, but an, a, a really kind of a live experience with the risen mm-hmm. Christ in the woods, mystical that you don't think of coming out of congregational reformed pastors, you know, <laughs> who study ten hours a day. But and that just changed his heart, his life, and he already knew Jesus. But that really, um, his affections were never the same, and they were always, uh, always just highlighting the beauty of Jesus and proclaiming that in the gospel. Okay, so who was he? Born in 1703, so we're talking a long time ago. 1703 in Connecticut, he entered Yale at l- just around 13 years old. Is that it? <laughs> so I already feel like an underachiever. <laughs> now, Yale then wasn't Yale now. But anyway, he entered Yale at 13 years old. He pastored in Northampton, Massachusetts for 23 years. His grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, was the longtime, I think, 60-year pastor there. Wow. And he assisted his, past- his, his grandfather for a couple of years. His grandfather died, and he becomes the pastor. And that's where he preaches sinners in the hands of an angry God. And that's where in Northampton during uh, 1729 to 52, in that range, uh, where there's also this revival in the mid 30s, I think, predating the George Whitfield awakening. But there's a small awakening in Northampton that he writes about. Um, in 52, he leaves to go farther west in Massachusetts out to a town we know as Stockbridge. And at that point, it was not a town, it was a missionary outpost. Missionary to who? To the Indians, to the natives. And so for five, six years, he spent uh, his life there ministering to and reaching out to the natives. Now we're talking 1750s. His um, son, Aaron Burr Sr., 
was the president of the College of New Jersey, which is now known as Princeton. And he, um, he died and the Princeton trustees pressed old Jonathan Edwards to take the post of president at Princeton. So January 1758, he becomes the president at Princeton. February 1758, he gets inoculated with smallpox. <laughs> March 1758. He dies. <laughs> and it's pretty bad, especially in our day today. We're talking about vaccines, all this stuff. He dies from the vaccine. I don't know. So we're not in 1758. I'm not going to say. Hey, what's the application but, on that? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just crazy. I mean, here he is, president of Ivy League school for two months. <laughs> and he's on the cutting edge of science and he croaks. <laughs> anyway, but a great thinker. We're going to talk a little bit more. Why are we talking about him? Three reasons. Number one, arguably the greatest mind mm. mind. America ever produced. Certainly the greatest mind America ever produced prior to the 20th century or maybe even World War II. Um, he, just, he just preached and wrote. Uh, he would spend 12 to 13 hours a day in his study. I don't think he got a lot of invitations to parties, yeah. <laughs> but, but he studied scripture and explored its depths. You can go to Yale today to the Beinecke Library and you can see the Bible that he, he took apart his normal Bible and interleaved between each page, a blank page, and then sewed it back up. So now it's twice as thick and there's a blank page in each page. And he's and it's filled with his writing, his studying, his reflections and his cross-references and everything. I mean, he just rejoiced in studying scripture and then communicating it. Because, you know, to be a pastor in that day, uh, his church had about 600 people in it. Um, two two-hour sermons each week, plus some Bible studies and some counseling. I mean, two two-hour sermons. Gosh. And, you know, he's not telling a bunch of stories. Yeah. I mean, he's reading the manuscript. But it's crazy. It's funny. We were talking with Brian Johnson uh, this week, and he said, you know, we're all busy, but we're also all distracted. Hmm. And I think about that as here's old Jonathan Edwards studying the Word of God for 12 and 13 hours a day as part of his calling. Um, certainly he had a unique calling, but boy, that pays dividends. And it starts to pay dividends aside from his sermons as he moves to Stockbridge. In those few years in Stockbridge, he wrote his four most important books. And two of them weren't published till he died. Yep. But The Freedom of the Will, The End for Which God Created the World, The Nature of True Virtue, and The Great Christian Doctrine of Original Sin. Because there are people out there who say there's no original sin, mm -hmm. and you can kinda, you're kind of okay, and you know. But he said, no, we got to get Scripture out there. Um, I have not read all these books, but the one I loved the most that I did read is The End for Which God Created yeah. the World, The Glory of God. And, um, and, but, and every page of these is saturated with Scripture and, and the lifetime devoted to study. Amazing, when you focus on God's Word, your mind expands. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's in part why he's the greatest mind America ever produced. Like, it's not just that he was studying science or something. It's that he was studying Scripture. And that's... Second thing is he lived willing to follow God. He did not have an easy ride in Northampton as a 23-year pastor. There, his, his grandfather for 60 years had different ideas and, and maybe we might say just a little, more, a little more loose on some things. And Jonathan Edwards said, no, we got to stick to the gospel. And so it was a hard road there in Northampton with the parish that he was called to love and minister to. When he moved to Stockbridge as a missionary to the Indians, these aren't great times to be missionaries to Indians. <laughs> like there are French Indian wars going on. There yeah. is a seven years war. There's these things where the British and the French are, um, are co-opting different Indian nations or Indian tribes and then fighting against each other. And, and, and it's just not an easy thing. Hmm. But he says the gospel to all nations. It's not just a white man's gospel. It's for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. So he moves out there to Stockbridge and uh, not afraid to follow the Lord. And I love that, the, the willing to follow God at every cost. One, my favorite um, proof of this is, you know, David Brainerd is that young missionary that goes out and, and, uh, and just burns out bright for Christ and dies young, but he just gives everything he has to, um, to reach the natives for Jesus. And, and actually, his journals... Um, 
Jonathan Edwards publishes, and he, he writes a little biography, kind of the first missionary biography, Edwards yeah. right about David Brainerd. Well, <clears throat> in the middle of one of the wars, while they're in Stockbridge, um, Brainerd says, hey, I need to take Jonathan Edwards Jr. with me because he's the only one that knows these languages because kids pick up the languages. Hmm. So in the middle of the war, he takes Jonathan Edwards Jr. and the dad is like, okay, let's do this for the gospel. Takes him 200 miles, there's no interstates, 200 miles into what's now upstate New York to reach the Indians for Christ. The boy was 10 years old. Gosh, it's crazy. Let that sink in. Un Believable, but a life and a family so devoted to the gospel of Jesus Christ that there's no better way to spend or expend a life than to move outward with the gospel. I, I stopped praying, Lord, keep my kids safe. I stopped praying that when I heard that. I'm like, Lord, keep them faithful. Hmm. <laughs> and I'm not saying I need to send my kid into war. I'm just saying, but if God calls me to. But yep. Jonathan Edwards was willing to follow God. The third reason... Uh, that I think it's worth us knowing about him, is his writings are transformative. Um, Sinners in the hands of an angry God. It is worth it. It's not all dour and mean. It's worth it. But that, that other book I was talking about, The End for Which God Created the World, it helped me see the glory of God as the point of all things, which is why you can send your 10-year-old son into a war zone, um, but because the glory of God in anything and everything. And that was just... So helpful for me. So that's, and, and, and more on that, but I just think uh, that book, by the way, The End for Which God Created the World is only 125 pages long. Like all of us can read that. We yeah. can get it. And there's a hundred scriptures on every page, it feels like. <laughs> and it's like, it's like seminary in a hundred pages. It's just great. Edwards is a gem in our history. He really is. Well, unfortunately, I picked the short straw. Now I got to do the next one as well. well. <laughs> For a Christian, you probably haven't heard of, but you're going to want to get to know. So, no, I'm actually say- just, I just, I love this one. When you uh, brought this name up, man, I, I, I skipped ahead yeah. and I, I already read some. So, well, there is a guy in our history. Now we're going to go to the revolutionary period. So I love this. I actually love the revolutionary period. It's, it's just a really fun time in history to study. And this guy's name is John Witherspoon. And he's born in Scotland, lived in Scotland for most most of his life, but he has a unique place in the history of this country. Wait for it, da, da, da. He is the only clergyman, only man of the cloth to sign the Declaration of Independence. (laughs) I mean, I just think this is great. So the next time- That was on his Twitter bio, I think. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) next time you're watching Jeopardy, (laughs) you know, John Witherspoon is the only clergyman to uh, sign the Declaration of Independence. And there is a story maybe that he double dog dared John Hancock to sign really big, but we're not 100% <laughs> sure of that. But anyway, here he is as a clergy. Um, why? Like, that's the point. Not just, wow, isn't that an interesting piece of trivia? Why was he there as a pastor? Why is he at the Continental Congress? Well, he's born in 1723 in Scotland. He lived there the first 45 years of his life. He's a descendant of John Knox, the great Scottish Presbyterian preacher, Um, married Elizabeth Montgomery. They had 10 children. He served two different churches, two different parishes in Western Scotland outside of Glasgow, Um, one in Beth and one in Paisley, so 12 or 11 years each. Writing books then, preaching well, thinker, super well-respected as an author, educator, theologian, pastor, preacher. Um, He... Uh, Wrote serious books. He also wrote satire. There's a few satires. The kind of pastor you want. It is. It is. And I think he would have been on Twitter if he was today, and it would have been the good stuff. It would have Babylon be all over the place. Oh, man. (laughs) I mean, he would have had a blast. (laughs) Interestingly, he was actually also, um, he led some militia to battle, but they didn't actually get in battle when there was a sort of a Catholic pro-Jacobite rebellion (laughs) in Scotland. So I'm like, imagine, I'm thinking like, I got to lead people in a battle as a pastor, but good for him. I mean, he's standing up for what he thinks. Um, And he actually got thrown in prison in in one of the castles on his way back because they didn't have to fight, but he was thrown in prison for, I don't know, you know, all these things, but not long. He got out fast. Uh, Super well sought after and... um, uh, in 1766, after 25 years of ministry there in Scotland, he was wooed by the trustees of the College of New Jersey. We heard about that with Edwards. 
now Princeton, to come and be their president. And he agreed. So this is after Edwards. It's almost at the revolution, 1768. He comes and he's the sixth president of Princeton and he avoids the smallpox yeah, vaccine. A little bit longer than two months. Huh? <laughs> yeah, he does not go near the smallpox <laughs> vaccine. But he spends then the next 25, 30 years teaching, writing, thinking, building a curriculum, building an institution, strengthening, fundraising, all these kinds of things. He's a thinker in the enlightenment vain, but always rooted in scripture. So he never departs from scripture. And that's, so there's three reasons why he's so important aside from his signature on the yeah. declaration. But here first, as a thinker in the enlightenment, in the true enlightenment, he never left reason plus revelation. Hmm. So revelation meaning God giving us wisdom, God giving us knowledge from on high. Reason meaning us thinking things through and reasoning them out. Reason and revelation. So much of the enlightenment thinking was just reason. And Witherspoon and several others, particularly out of Scotland and the reform movement, kept revelation linked to it. Hmm. That's why we did not have a French Revolution with Robespierre, the Reign of Terror, and the guillotine, because they were reason only, no revolution. Hmm. So he actually, he being part of this group, linking reason and revelation together and never giving up on that, he saved us from the excesses of that. So that's one thing, and, and there's way more there. It's just, this is just really yeah. fun to think. Second thing that is especially fun to think of in our day and age is he was very strong on religious toleration. Might not sound like it if he's leading troops into battle, but he is. And he helped solidify the idea in our country of the separation of church and state. He didn't invent the idea. He's not the only one, but he was part of that group of people make, giving feet to this and giving logical weight to the separation of church and state. So the, the, the Reformed Church in those days and, and up to today, and, and I mean, we think this is, is smart, is the spirituality of the church. They have this doctrine called the spirituality of the church, where the church is not meant to govern all civic affairs, although influence it. But like the elders of Grace Fellowship are not also supposed to be the county commissioners of Lenore County. Yeah. And that's a little different than, you know, say the Holy Roman Empire <laughs> and, sure. and so on. Scotland, actually, where, where the Reformation was strong, there was a careful separating. Like in England, the king, King Henry VIII, he stays the head of the church. Mm -hmm. And so even to this day, Queen Elizabeth II is the head of the Church of England. In Scotland, it's always separate, the head of state and the, and the head of the church, the moderator of the Church of England. So this toleration and this willingness for there to be a separation. Okay, great. Anyway, it's just helpful to know here, this idea of the separation of the church and state in this country's history is rooted in guys like Witherspoon thinking through scripture mm. and, and enlightenment, you know, with revelation and reason. The third reason he's worth us just, just talking about for a few minutes here is because of his legacy at Princeton. At Princeton, over the 25, 30 years that he led and taught there, he impacted numbers of leaders of this country, like it's almost unbelievable. So Continental Congress, at which he was a delegate, 12 members of that Continental Congress he taught at Princeton. Five delegates at the Constitutional Convention. President James Madison was one of his students. Vice President Aaron Burr, sir, was one of his students. 49 of the earliest representatives in the Congress. 28 senators. Now, we didn't have 100 senators back then. 28 of them Witherspoon Gosh. taught and poured into, three Supreme Court justices, and on and on, district judges, secretaries of state, attorneys general, on and on. He's the man who helped found and form our nation in a teaching way. I'm telling you, teachers change man. the world. Amen. So, John Witherspoon, that's there's incredible. a little bit of fun. Yeah, so, I mean, I just I always enjoy doing this podcast so much, <laughs> whether it's I get to present or I just get to listen to you twice. Uh, so, everybody... Better that than was, seeing me twice. Hey, yeah, I usually just stare over here. So, guys, that was three Christians you should know. One you know, one you've heard of, and then one you should have. So Martin Luther King Jr., Jonathan Edwards, John Witherspoon. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Like this, share this, send it to somebody. See you next week. This is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Visit gracekinston.org or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.